So I'm Alessandra Belloni and I'm very happy to be at the Italian American Museum on Mulberry Street in New York. I just uh, did a presentation and uh, showed the DVD of our production called Tarantella Spider Dance and it's been a four or five years in the making. It's been my project for a long time to make this show into what I say sometimes the Italian river dance. So it's a show that is all about the history of our dance from the ancient Greek times until today. So I kind of made it more modern with the techno beat, with a hip-hop version, but, but it's all traditional music until the end and then it becomes more modern music. And right now we are in the process, we've done it already last year with a Broadway producer and choreographer and with some investors. Now we're ready to bring it with business plan and entertainment lawyers, all that's going to be done on Monday as we speak, to bring it to investors to make a long off-Broadway run. The theater we have in mind is New World Stages on 8th Avenue and 15th Street. And because of the nature of the show and so unique, we envision a long open-ended run, hopefully starting the spring of 2012, if money comes through the funding that we need. Uh, for an open-ended run, we're trying to raise 750,000, even though we can start with much less. You know, we're about 100,000, we can start it. And uh, we envision a, a, a 40, 499 seats theater, and we think it's gonna sell out, because every time we've done it, we sold out everywhere, and in Italy it was a hit. So our approach now is to get the word around, people might be able to help us in fundraising, and in publicity because that's what's important that once you have the show up people have to know about it so I trust that the Italian American Italians can help us to spread the word around and make an off Broadway and maybe a Broadway show of the Tarantella that's it Good evening everybody Very much appreciate it. For those who may not know who I am, I'm Dr. Joseph Shelson, the president and founder of the Italian American Museum. And uh, many of you are familiar faces, so I think all of you actually know. So you all probably know who I am already. I have to do this for the camera, so <laughs> that's what it's about. We're very thrilled tonight to have a real artist. Not that we haven't had artists before, but a real live artist who's going to do a real live performance for you and some demonstrations. Uh, Alessandra Bologna. Um, she has been uh, doing these types of performances with her, with her group, actually, for many, many years. I've seen her in Sabbath Mata at uh, St. John the Divine. You know, I've seen her also perform here at the Church of Most Precious Blood. Um, and the, very unique, um, very, very original. Uh, original to the customs of Italy, particularly Sicily. Without further ado, I give you uh, Alessandro Bologna. Alexander. I just want to say a little bit about my background. I, I'm from Rome originally, but my grandparents uh, came from the south of Rome, and they actually played the folk music of our region, of Lazio. So I grew up listening to Tarantella, Saltarello, Stornelli, all the typical folk songs. My grandfather played the mandolin and tambourine and snare drum in the band of his town, Rocca di Papa, where they make really good wine. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was from Ciociaria, which is another beautiful land in the mountains, and she sang very beautifully, so they came together, actually they fell in love with the music, which I learned quite late. So as a child, I had to listen to the folk music every Sunday, but of course being a generation that was listening to rock and roll at that time, and even in China, you know, America influenced us a great deal, um, I wasn't happy to listen to the folk music because I was forced to listen to it. Then when I came to, to New York to study um, acting, mime, commedia dell'arte, music and dance, I rediscovered my roots. I went back you know, to Italy in the 70s, heard the folk music, touched my heart immensely, and then I remember something that I knew, and it was my grandparents. But, so then I started a journey that took me a long time, I'm still on that journey, and uh, to learn the folk music and dances from the people of the south of Italy instead of just reading a book or watching a movie. The, real, the only way to learn this tradition is by being there with them, eating with them, drinking with them, staying up all night, 
drumming and dancing and singing. I made a lot of mistakes too as I learned, but it was an incredible journey, which I speak of in my book. So today, which is called Rhythm is the Cure. So today, I will do a little bit of both. I'll perform and speak and explain. Um, and of course, I cannot tell you all the story because we'll be here for a long, long time. But, <laughs> but I started then the, the company that he knows very well because they, they used to come and film us a lot too with Cuban television. In 1979, with the music director, composer, guitarist John La Barbera, is Italian American, Sicilian originally. Mm -hmm. And when we started, we had no idea where we would go because no one, as far as we knew, had known this music, the Italian folk music, the authentic music. Not Osolemio, not Malafemena, not that kind of music, but the real traditional music. The immigrants brought it with them at the turn of the century. That's the only music they know. So, so, so this is the music of the peasants, the music of people who were illiterate, because people who were much more educated probably would go to the opera or, or would listen to classical songs. But the people who came here, they really didn't have much uh, education in school, but had an, an immense valuable education, which is the education of their land. They brought these traditions with them. So I think they were more educated, to my opinion. They were the people who kept the ancient knowledge, and they still do, of the land where they came from. But I think I'm not a, you know, I wasn't born here, I was born there, so I do feel that there was a lot of embarrassment that people went through as they tried to assimilate to become American. So uh, people have lost touch with what was their true tradition of the music and the dance and the rituals. So I want to just make that distinction. I do not do folkloristic music, which is the washed down version that you may have seen in America. I do the popular, musica popolare, of the people. So it's not folkloristic. Folkloristic is when it's really washed down and made into you know, specific things. When it's real, it's popolare in Italian. So we would say popular. All this said, I know we're going to talk about it. The Tarantella, the, not the silly wedding dance, but the real one, okay? <laughs> so, I know you want to hear some of it. So what I'd like to do is do a little bit of a journey through the instruments that I specialize in, which is um, the frame drums and tambourines. And as I tell you a little bit of each style, I'll play it. So you probably see what you need to enjoy and maybe this is called Tamorra. Tamorra. So it's called Tamorra. It just means large tambourine. And this is a typical Neapolitan, even though this I designed with Remo. Um, and it's used for a dance that is still really, really popular all over Naples and Salerno. The regional campaign is called Tamorriata. Tamoriata. Which is a 4 4 rhythm for people who play percussion. And it's also um, has a very strong North African and African influence, being that it's the south of Italy is close to Africa as well as it was Magna Grecia. So, so um, these drums have a very beautiful origins. They're pre Christian, for, of course, and they come from thousands of years ago. You can see a lot of prints, a lot of mosaics paintings that, that show mainly women playing tambourine and they go back to the ancient worship of the goddess of the earth yes. the mother earth, la madre terra coming from Anatolia, from Turkey, Cibele, the dark goddess <coughs> excuse me, of the earth and Isis from Egypt Iside in Italiano and Artemis of Ephesus, Diana Ephesina Hecate, the goddess of the underworld. So these were all dark goddesses. And they thought their darkness, hard to, to explain, symbolizes mainly the womb of the earth where you come from. And mainly women, priestesses, use these drums to honor the goddesses and to enter a trance state of mind to invoke the power of the goddess to heal the community or for initiations in the misteri, also known as Misteri Eleusini, the it's mysteries of Demeter, that sister does very, very, very so here how it goes. Here it goes.
Okay, you heard music before. Uh, yes? No, sorry. So, you would think it's the teaching of Italian music, am I wrong? <laughs> so, uh, again, this is a Neapolitan, Tarantella, but her name is Tam Moriata. And now this is done in honor of the Madonna. And I know you have a fantastic statue here. That's when I came in, I thought, why haven't I been here before? <laughs> because you have a black Madonna. So, and that's La Madonna Nera. So this is done as a devotional ritual drumming mm -hmm. and dance and singing to the mother, to the black Madonna. So the people get together in very remote places, not so much anymore in the city of Naples, even though now it's, there is a revival of this I think they still do it in Piedi Grotta on September 8th, but mostly from May to September 16th, a different festivity of the Madonna, the, the peasants gather and they uh, do the celebration in front of a church in Mother Domini, which is near Salerno, uh, Somma Vesuviana, which is by the Vesuvius, and Lettere in Ogragnano, dove c'è il vino buono, la pasta e pomodori, that one of the places that has the most exportation of Pasta, tomatoes, and wine is Gragnano, where they celebrate the Tamboriata. That's where I learned in that place specifically. So they come together all night as devotion. This is devotional drumming. So it's very different from social. It's, it's to ask the miracle, to ask the grace. So the, the vow to the Madonna is to drum all night, dance all night, or sing all night, all the three of them, in, you know, at different moments. So they start usually around 10 p.m. and end at 6 a.m. So you cannot stop until the sun comes up. That's the tradition, and that's the tradition of a lot of indigenous people around the world. And the beauty of this that I experienced, and I speak a lot in the book, is that when I first went to learn to take, you know, with a little tape recorder and those times, and to take the pictures, I thought that it was, of course, some pagan ritual, but would the miracles really happen? They do. They really do, and since my first time, that's what happened. My brother was sick, very sick, and he got healed. Through the night that I was doing this for him, and another thing is it's the walk, is very, very important to walk barefoot as if chanting. So um, I started to feel there was something more than just a, a legend. It's not a legend, it's true. So that journey from that time, and this was in, in 1980, a couple of days ago, <laughs> <laughs> I started to say, ah, then why is the Madonna black? So I started my own path of researching the black Madonna mm -hmm. and understanding the power of these rituals that are so ancient and why all these churches are in such spectacular places, usually by the water or by the, on the mountains, in the forest, in the cave. So probably there was ancient worship of the earth as a he healing living being, that's what I understood. So, and, and out of that journey that lasted many, over 20 years, I wrote an opera called The Voyage of the Black Madonna that they also filmed <laughs> back in the time. Uh, Joe, Joe and I go back a long, a long time. And so that was about the worship of the Black Madonna, the <coughs> chanting, the drumming, and why it's so important to go back to it today. Because what I found is that the people that they call peasants have that knowledge that the earth is a living being, a thinking being that can has to be nourished or she will destroy us as we're destroying her. So that was the spirit of our show, which at that time seemed a little bit off the wall. Right now everyone talks about this. <laughs> and, um, and the leader of that opera was the poet Virgil, which in Naples is very important because he was the one that uh, was uh, initiated in the mysteries of the goddess of the earth and wrote these beautiful poems in this mountain called Monte Vergine, near Avellino, and also healed the sick with herbs. So he was the leader of the opera, and he took us on a journey. So before I move on to more tarantellas, I want to do the chant. Huh? Okay. Monte Vergine! Yes. Exactly. How did you get? Well, you, anyone should have it excuse. <laughs> so that's called Mamma Schiavona. You can say that. You say Mamma, Mamma Schiavona. Schiavona. Oh. Because she, okay, so here is a little legend. In Naples they say, Amaron tiene sette sore, sette sore, alla murti ma più brutta, ma la più bella, la Maron arena, Maron è molto vergine. She speaks in Napoli, Yes. Have you heard this before? No, um, I haven't, but okay. I, I understood it. Okay. So that was the end of our opera. I think Joe probably remembers that, that we had, um, at the end, everyone came together and, and was saying the legend of Naples, seven Madonnas, okay. 
of which the one, the last one, is supposed to be the ugliest. So she ran up the mountain called Monte Vergine, the Virgin Mountain, to hide from the people. But the people that really wanted to find her, which is this is very symbolic, and then I went to this personal, so I can tell you what that's like. When you really want to find her, you have to go up the mountain, you have to chant, you have to ask for miracles. Then you find her and you see that she's the most beautiful of all. But she was black. This is a little bit uh, um, wider because that's still happened through the centuries. They made her a little wider, but she was much darker. So they call her Mamma Schiavona, the slave mother, the serving mother. And she's a spectacular Madonna because she's huge. And so the way to go there, you have to go up the mountain. And then there is a place where you sit on a chair where you ask for miracles, and then you go into the church on your knees, chant, and you see that her eyes will follow you all around the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And this sanctuary is built on a temple called the Temple of Cibele, where Virgil, the poet, used to go and write poems. So imagine, mm -hmm. there is no place mm -hmm. in New York with all the Italian yes. Americans together. I think we're the majority, majority of the minority, right? Yes. We are the yes. minority. Yes. 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 But we don't have a school, we don't have anything that teaches these things. I mean, I haven't pursued it immensely because I tour a lot, but now I really feel, because I teach a lot around the world, yes. that we need a place where people can come, and if I'm not here, my students can keep teaching to learn these traditions. It's yes. yeah. So, you know the chant, you sing along, or we need again. <laughs> You can go up the mountain by car, or you can take um, La Funivia, I don't remember. Funiculari. Funiculari. Yeah. And, uh, but if you want to do it right, go, yeah, walk, right. <laughs> That's what the women did. So the chant I just did is also very ancient, and it's definitely pre-Christian, because it uses a scale called the Lydian scale, the Neapolitan scale, the augmented fourth, which is this, ah, Uh, in the ancient times, since the Tarantella also originated in music therapy, so I'm going to move to that soon and talk to you about that and show you. Um, this scale was part of the therapy, so they used this scale to calm the people that were either beaten by the Tarantula 
or they suffer from depression. Mm -hmm. So they don't take Prozac or all kinds of stuff, <laughs> no electric shots, <laughs> they chant it. And then drama and dance. And that's the beauty of our history. Compared to the Greeks or the Spanish or the French of that area, the Mediterranean, they have all lost that. The Italians haven't. It hasn't carried on to this country, unfortunately, as much, except our group and maybe two other groups now exist in the United States. But the Italians have kept this music dance um, therapy tradition. It's not something of the past, it's something of today. So if you do go today, you find a lot of groups playing and drumming and singing and dancing this music. So, and people did know then that this music can heal you. So that's why chanting all night had that power to calm you and then ask for the grace, for the miracle, which I experienced in Montevergia many times, they really happened. And this is a chant that I actually did, now I don't want to cry, that I, when my mom passed away, it, I just, I chanted this to her, and I felt a vibration really helping her soul journey. And I chanted at the funeral because I, my mother was very devoted to the Madonna, so it just came natural to sing. So the first line is, Salim to Montagnon, and let's go up the sacred mountain. The last line is always, uh, it's always like, we came and left, we've always been graced by you. So there's always one first line and one last line, and, uh, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lyrics. So this drum that I use, it's not traditional Italian, it's called the ocean drum. The reason I use it is to calm people when I do the healing workshop, but it's also because it creates the sound of seeds. And the tambourine initiated, uh, and was, I mean, was made by women that used the, the, sits, the strainers to plant seeds into the earth. With that, they made the drum with the skin of the goat and jingles. And now they use the tops of tomato cans. So with this one, I want to show you why I use it. With a, a chant, uh, a work chant of the women from Basilicata, very tiny region, full of magic. And it's called Fronni Dalia, it means uh, olive branch. And it's a story of a young girl forced to marry a man she didn't love by the father, but then she swears to the father that the first night of the wedding she ran away with the man she truly loved. So she did. So the women who picked the olives still sing her story.
want to move into now. So this is all my arrangements for these drums. That's not the part traditionally the way that songs would be done. It's, of course, as a musician, then you start creating your own sound, your own, and of course, I also write my own songs. But um, for me, that was an interesting process because I really imagine the women working all day and doing this, this hard work and figuring out what to do with those instruments. They played them <laughs> and sang and danced. It, it is a very physical style of playing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's a drawback because of where people played this was for rituals, so they didn't do it in original performance. And the women that played this are very strong women, really powerful. That, the other thing is that it, there is an energy that comes from this rhythm, like all drumming, that goes beyond uh, what you, you know, I would say cerebral style drumming, which would be classical or reading music. You enter and alter state of mind. Once you learn the technique, you have to surrender to the fact that the divine force will come in and you just keep going. Because when I first started, of course, I didn't have that stamina. And um, I had a lot of funny experiences because I couldn't drum with the guys. Because now the women don't play so much anymore. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that you know, I always say is women were planting, you know, in the, in the fields, they really worked very hard. Those are the same women who came to this country and they didn't really um, have the luxury of babysitters or anything like that, you know? <laughs> so that's why they do that. So through the years of drumming all night and challenging the guys, then I, be I became really strong that now I can win the guys. This is <laughs> so people don't know me are foolish to challenge me. They never stop. They don't they don't, once they know that, they don't challenge me anymore. Because I learned, I learned that it just became, okay, there is Alexander. So, and that's what I teach. When I teach my workshops, which I, I mean, I'll talk more at the end, is to empower women to do that, not to get tired, just to keep going. If the women did it once, we can still do it. Yes. The guys can do it, that's no doubt. But we need to find that power again that came from the earth. And do this, because this is a feminine style. So, yes, you have a question? Did you say you designed some of these drums? Yeah, these are my designs. So, yeah. <laughs> All of these are my design. And uh, they are... Now, they're made by Remo, which is the largest percussion industry in the world. By the way, Remo Belli from Piemonte invented the synthetic skin of drum sets in the 50s. No, I don't know, most people don't know it was an Italian who invented that, that changed the history of music because then it became rock because they could beat on the drum set. So he has a very big industry in Valencia, in California, and he signed me up in 1996 to develop tambourines for them. So these are synthetic, but they, they also they don't break, they don't change, and they have a specific sound that I designed for singing as well. <laughs> so the authentic ones have goat skin, and I, I didn't bring them with me because sometimes, they, you know, with the weather, they, they just don't make it. Do you have one here, Alison, or the, the old one? So I want to show you, this is another Black Madonna design I made. This is inspired by Vigiano in Basilicata, and it's also inspired by Spain, La Madonna di Monserrato. So uh, I'll show you one of these tarantellas that comes from Sardegna, which is called Ballo Tondo, Round Dance. It's a healing trance rhythm. They don't call it tarantella per se, they call it Ballo dell'Argia. And in that tradition, there is a circle where there's one person inside that's coming that's being bitten by a mythical animal, it's not the tarantula, I'm going to explain all that in a second. In their tradition, it's a mythical animal, and they're possessed by that animal, and they have to dance to send it away. So this is called Ballo Tondo, it's a women's chant, and the women chant this to the children to teach them the rhythm, believe it or not, as their babies, so they got to learn this, this really fast rhythm. But they also do it to send away their sadness, so again, it's a self-healing. Because usually the women uh, that were, I'm speaking about were married to shepherds, so they spent a lot of time alone in the mountains. Oh. And this was their way to send away their sadness, their loneliness. <laughs> I'm 
Maybe I need the next problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I need the next problem. Maybe I need the next problem. To learn from your people, I don't know many people that learn from their parents this drumming style because it's so obscure. There's no school where you can go and study. Now in Rome, there is one, there's more classes going on, but it's not something that is really taught in a, in a conservatory, really. So you have to really figure out what to do if you want to learn it. And what I did is what we say, rubare con gli occhi. So I had to steal with my eye. <laughs> and I learned in Brazil to do the same thing. So, um, and so I, rubando con gli occhi, I, every time I went somewhere, somebody would play one style of tarantella, which I, I'll show you. But uh, the funny thing about the south of Italy, which is common in some places, is that they don't really get along with each other, you know? So, I mean, this is really between towns. So you go to Montemarano in the province of Torino, and then you go to another place, and, and they're always like fighting with each other. So they would tell me, this is the only way to play the other guys don't know what they're doing. Which is, you know, not true. Everyone can play different ways, so that's when I teach, I say that. So the beauty of that is that rhythm, you can become global. So I'll show you what I do with the, what I learned from everybody. that we have in our culture, the Mediterranean, so as southern Italy was part of Greece called Magna Grecia, we have the same myths, the same gods, sometimes different names because the Romans may have given it a different name. But So there is the myth of Arachne, Arachne the beautiful girl in some versions, the princess in some versions, it's not always the same. She was a, the most skilled weaver of the land of ancient Greece. And uh, all the people who admired her asked her if she had learned from the goddess Athena. And she was very proud, a little bit arrogant, and she said, no, she was better than the goddess. And that indeed she would challenge the goddess to a weaving contest, so she did. And Athena accepted the challenge of weaving, and Arachne won the challenge, the contest. Her linen was better. But she also mocked the gods in her weaving. So um, Athena, in fury and jealousy, broke and uh, destroyed the linen in a thousand pieces and, put a, and then hit Arachne on her head. And poor Arachne, in humiliation, young virgin, she committed suicide and hung herself from a tree. And Athena, taken by pity, transformed her into a spider, thus condemning her to weave her web forever. <laughs> so that's the origin of the spider myth, that it's in our subconscious mind, the archetype, as the people call it. Then the legend goes on as young women of Athens, Greece, southern Italy, were taken by a collective suicide mania, which is something that still happens today among people in their adolescence. So this is very powerful myth, it's, not, it's from the past, but it definitely speaks about today. So the young women were uh, taken by collected suicide mania, and uh, it stopped when the oracle of Delphi, La Sibylla, the prophetess, spoke and said that if the women were allowed to celebrate the rites of the god, actually it was a semi-god, Dionysus, or Bacchus, 
the god of ecstasy, wine, very complex god. Yes. If they were allowed to celebrate him, to dance in his honor, possessed by the god, they would be freed from this depression because that's what they suffered from. So that's how this uh, ecstatic rites of Dionysus began. The women were called Bacchus, Bacchante. And if you're interested in this, if you study the classicals, you would probably know Euripides, Uri the yeah. Greek writer, wrote a beautiful tragedy. It's a tragedy, but it's beautiful. That speaks about the Bacchantes and how they're possessed by the god. So they were very wild women. They lived in the woods, they played the tambourine, they were in an altered state of mind, they wore deer skin, they were anti probably society, and they were free to leave their sexuality and sensuality. So they called in the men in these rituals, which were orgiastic rituals. So the Darantella originated as an orgy, really, pretty much. Then seen, but in a sacred way, so not the connotation, not the pornography that we see today, nothing like that. It was a sacred way of honoring love among men and women, but it was mainly women leading, which of course then started to be suppressed by the church when the Christianity came. But in Italy, this tradition never died. They had <laughs> gatherings in the solstice, December, June, Carnevale, then it became Carnevale, Mardi Gras. And no one knows how it got transformed because in during the, what they call the Dark Ages, a lot of things were not written down. But this dance during the Crusades was popular, you know, especially in places like Sicily, Calabria, Puglia. And the meeting with the Islamic also created certain movements, certain dances. So then in the Renaissance we know that there was a dance that was attributed to the spider bite. So that a lot of women and men were running wild in the streets and dancing and dancing using swords saying they were beaten by the tarantula and it was the poison that made them go crazy and they had to dance to get the poison out of the body. And they had to stomp their feet, spin around and become the spider. So the dance of the spider is quite, quite erotic because you will see it here, it's on the floor and you have to be really um, you know, in a trance to let it happen. So the, by doing that, they cut the imaginary web they lived in mm -hmm. and they were free. So, only in the 1960s, in the late 1950s, a great group of Italian, um, we, and this is a book you probably should get, it's now in English, it's called The Land of the Remorse. It, uh, they did a study on what they found were still the Tarantati in Puglia, in a, Puglia is you know, the, the end of Italy, Salento is the last part of Italy, and they went down to study these people because they were, they were all crazy, that's what they said. They were crazy, they were beaten, they got to dance and they had to play the music. But in reality, they found out as they studied them and they were psychoanalysts, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists and ethnomusicologists, then, then they wrote everything down. They found that these people really suffered from what they would have called depression or manic depression, sometimes hysteria because they were sad, they lived in very poor conditions at that time, before the Tarantati were from all different social status, and they were mainly women, they were not allowed to marry the men they loved, most of them suffered of unrequited love, so il morso della tarantola, the bite of the tarantula, is also known as morso d'amore, bite of love, because it's the, lang the anguish, the longing for love, that drove them crazy and they had to get the poison out of the body. And then through the dance, which lasted three days and three nights, oh. they would release this. And the musicians were like the doctors or the shamans that knew the cure using those scales that I spoke about before to freedom. So then at the end of June, June 29th, all the people would go back together, all the Tarantati, in one little church in Galatina and dance and dance and went crazy until they got out of this trance, the only people allowed in were the tambourine players, and they will uh, come out of the church with no memory of what happened to them during the time they were sick. So it was a very interesting phenomenon, because once a tarantato or tarantata, they were always tarantati. Every year in June, they fall back into the depression, knowing that they could get it out of their system through the dance. So that's the power of the tarantella, and that's what I've devoted most of my life to experience as a teacher, to do healing workshops, mainly for women, but men are welcome, and to write a show that we're hoping to bring off Broadway soon, which is this one. So before I go to that, let me show you a couple of Tarantella styles, because we're talking about Sicily. Great. And 
quick question. Did they yeah. drink a lot of wine while they were dancing, or was it no. just really <laughs> No, the musicians didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so wait a minute. In the ancient times, yes, the Bacantes would go through wine. Sick. They still do that in Italy. But the Tarantate, they were sick, didn't drink or it's only water. Oh. Dressed in white, they danced on a white sheet in their house with colorful ribbons. It was also color therapy. And they were doing that for three days, three nights. No food, only water. Oh. Going in complete trance. But the musicians drank a lot of wine to play for three days and three nights. Wow. <laughs> That's the wine they must have in fact. But in ancient times, yes. Wine, wine is still important today. So when you go to a feast all night, the first thing people bring out is barrels of wine, homemade wine. Yes. Otherwise, nobody moves. Mm -hmm. Nobody dances, nobody sings, nobody dances. <laughs> <laughs> Unheard of. So what are we doing with this? Okay, so I'll give you uh, an example of a Sicilian tarantella. Now, this is not the spider bite, because I'll, I'll end with that one. Um, and uh, the Sicilians have a different style. which means I would like to buy a drill. La porta, la porta spiritusari. You speak Sicilian? So it means to make a hole in the door of your bedroom to see how beautiful you really are when you take off all your clothes and now you go to bed. Then he says, oh my God, I didn't think that my eyes were seeing right because I could not believe the God who made you super God and how <coughs> and so and he praises her hair and so that's why he gets out of the water and it's really like oh the <laughs> Yeah, and that's why I think, I don't know how much time I but you have to get some CDs, because my CDs are the whole band. So we have guitar, mandolin, flutes, violins, accordion, and sometimes bagpipes. But what you said, the bagpipe is very important. The, the bagpipe did not you know, originate in Northern Europe, it originated in Italy. And no one really knows how to speak, to study ethnomusicology. We use the largest bagpipes in the world, that's why they're hard to play. You need to learn circular breathing. And certain tarantellas originally were done voice, bagpipe, tambourine. Then it became the accordion. Before accordion, it was bagpipes. Because that's what the shepherds knew how to do with the double breathing. Then there is another shom instrument used, which is called charamella, yeah, which is fantastic. These are very hard instruments to play. Do you play? No, no, but I know. I accept a little bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, just. Uh, so in this case, like in this song I just did, the bagpipe would not be used. It would be the Joe's harp, the marranzano. Okay. Okay. Oh it was cut and yes. Okay. 
but I can show you one when they will use it. Right? They don't tell you. So in Calabria they use this card. They use a lot of this card. So in, the, in this song, the very frame, they go da 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 So I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, so this is called La Frasca, again about love. It's a young man who's in love with two sisters, he doesn't know which one to go with, so he's going to get them both to decide after when she likes him. So of one of these chants of the Black Madonna, the origin comes, it's in Latin, so it's medieval, done in Spain, done in Italy, and it's a prayer, it's an Ave Maria. So it's Cunctisimus Concanentes Ave Maria. And I put to this uh, uh, six day trance rhythm from Calabria, which is called Ritmo di San Rocco, which is done every uh, August, the last Sunday of August, in a town called Gioiosa Ionica. Anyone here from Calabria? No, it's possible. Everywhere I go, I find the Calabrians. <laughs> First time! One quarter. Okay. Because yeah. I love Calabria. That's the place I know the most. Yes. I've been everywhere there. And I played in this drum festival where they play for 12 hours, a very obsessive rhythm, going back to the Middle Ages, when they brought the saint, they still do that, San Rocco, which they have all over here in America, he was the one who healed people from the plague. So the people do this dancing and spinning and circular dancing uh, to this very obsessive 6 8 rhythm, sending away the fear of death by cont contagious disease. And I put it together, that rhythm together with this prayer. This is how it goes. <laughs>
So Alex and Scott have been here before, I think, many times. And she's really my best student. She's a professional musician, but she's come with a lot of dedication, so she learned a lot. She learned the singing, the drumming, the dancing. She's been in my shows. She was the narrator of Spider Dance. And she's in my women ensemble, also called the Daughters of Cibele. So that proves that if you are dedicated, you can do it. So tambourine takes more time, but it's possible to practice like everything else. So if you have a CD player, <laughs>
Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
off in our house much time does it take to learn what you have? You've gotten 30 years experience. What no, do the like dances do that? doesn't take that much. Alison is going to show you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so let's say if you are inclined to folk dancing, yes. Um, when I teach, usually I teach for two hours. I'm teaching on Sunday in New Jersey. And you can, you know, let's say we were to do once a week or twice a month, mm -hmm. you can learn in probably two, three months a lot of repertoire. Okay. Well, it needs repetition, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. That's why I, my aim, you know, that's what I was telling to Joey, so let's find a space where we can do this because yes. people would come. I know they come from everywhere because now it's the time, it's really happening. So yes. now there is an interest in this one before maybe it was a little bit obscure, mm -hmm. people were embarrassed. The thing is that the Tarantella is much more sensual than it yes. people think it is. Of course, when I do my workshop, so I, if you sign my list right here, I'll send you information. I teach every summer in Tuscany. This is my 12th year. I rent a villa and I do a healing workshop called Rhythm is the Cure, where people come from all over the world that study with me, dedicated to singing, drumming, and dancing. So I'll bring some brochures here probably, and sure. it's a very cheap workshop. It's $1,400, including three fantastic meals a day in a spectacular place in the Chianti region, so oh. you're the one. Yes. <laughs> 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 so if you sign the lease before you leave that...